Um, I meant to, um, I, I wanted to send this very famous image of Yiftach's daughter last week when, with the instructions for reading this, um, these chapters, but I didn't want to tip anyone off in case this was your first encounter with, uh, with this story. I didn't want to tip you off to the fact that Yiftach had a daughter before you read the story. The, uh, the author takes care to reveal this to us late in the game. Okay, so the, the, the author clearly doesn't want to reveal to the readers the existence of, of Iftach's daughter when we're introduced to Iftach and when Iftach makes his vow. Okay? And, and that's why, and, and that way he intensifies the surprise for when the audience um, for, for, for the audience, when, when the audience encounters the scene, when the victorious hero comes home. Uh, so this way the, the author, the biblical author, makes the reader really sense and, and experience Yiftach's surprise and heartbreak. You know, the reader goes with Yiftach from the thrill of victory to the agony of defeat. And so I wanted, uh, wanted you all to have that experience as you as you read um, for our next meeting I'd like you to please read the story of Samson which is Judges chapters 13 through 16 it's the most detailed and the best of the bunch of, of, of the judges this is the longest the most detailed the most complete story from a literary perspective and and also the best story so uh, I, I know you'll enjoy it, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm offering a money-back guarantee. Uh, um, as you read Samson's story, please consider whether Samson belongs in the book of Judges among the, the other Israelite leaders and saviors. Also, and, and I say this because some people think that he does not belong, some commentators. Also, please contemplate why Samson tells Delilah his secret. Okay. Now the, tell, uh, the, the, tell, the text tells us plainly, so we needn't wonder. Okay. The, the, te- the, the author tells us that he told her because she nagged him and nagged him and nagged him until he couldn't bear it anymore. You'll find this in Judges 16.16. 16. Um, but... Okay, so, so the author tells us he did it because she nagged him and he couldn't bear it. But by that point of, of the story, after his three previous false confessions to her, he knew for certain that she would cut his hair. Okay? Every time he told her his quote-unquote secret, she acted on it. Okay? So she, he should have known, or he knew, that she would cut his hair this time. So... Um, so how then could any degree of nagging convince him to give up his secret? Okay, to, to basically give himself up to his enemies. So please consider that. Uh, so whether he belongs in the book of Judges and why he told Delilah his secret. Now this story takes place in the territory of Dan, the tribe of Dan, which... Okay, so this is the tribe of Dan in the center of what is modern Israel. This is kind of between, you know, south of Tel Aviv, north of, uh, of Gaza. Um, okay, so, so this, the, the, the center of the land of Israel. <coughs> um, and as, as you can see here uh, on the map, the tribe of Dan was located on the edge of these five Philistine city-states. Okay, right here in what is today the Gaza Strip. Sorry, these dogs here. Um, So, so the, the, the tribe of Dan is on the edge or in Philistine territory. Um, a very, which was a very unhappy location if you were not a Philistine. Um, 
Now, because, uh, because the tribe of Dan, Samson's tribe, was so small and weak, it could not take or, or hold its allotted territory um, in, in this very kind of um, very, very good real estate in, in the land of Israel. Okay, so it was a prime location. He had a very strong uh, presence there by the very strong Philistines. And, and that's why the tribe of Dan, which is one of the smallest and weakest of the 12 tribes, couldn't settle or couldn't hold, couldn't hold exclusively its, 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 ter its allotted territory. Um, so the tribe of Dan, the, the settlers uh, of, of this tribe, did not do well against the local Canaanites and the Philistines, <clears throat> which, which, led, which would lead the tribe of Dan to seek new territory where it wouldn't be under the yoke of these powerful neighbors. So during the period covered in the book of Judges, uh, before the establishment of the monarchy in the book of Samuel, part of the tribe, or, or maybe most of the tribe, uh, migrated to the far north, to the edges, right here, to the edges of the territory of, of Naphtali, and, and, and settled, settled in this location. Uh, they conquered the city of, of Laish, in the upper, um, up, upper ends of the Jordan Valley, and renamed it Dan. Okay, so this Dan, the, this city right here on the Jordan, in, in the Jordan River Valley, uh, was originally the, the, the city of, or the city of Laish, uh, Canaanite city, and they, they conquered it and renamed it Dan. This is near the, uh, near what is today the border between Israel and Lebanon. Uh, so therefore, when you read the, the when you read the phrase from Dan to Beersheba or Beersheba in the Bible, you need to keep in mind that the geography of the tribe of Dan changed from the time of Joshua's settlement to later on in the Bible. Okay, that that, that the tribe of Dan no longer lived in the heart again in in this area but lived way up far here in this area. Okay, so, so the phrase does not mean, you know, when, when you hear from Dan to Beersheba, Beersheba um, it does not mean from the center to the south, but rather from the far, far north, from the far northern reaches of the land of Israel to its far, far southern edge. Okay, the entire land of Israel. Okay, from Dan to Beersheba is a poetic way of saying the entire land of Israel or, or all of the tribes of Israel. Um, and by the way, after the southern and northern kingdoms will, will divide, so after the kingdoms of the United Kingdom of Saul, David, and Solomon, uh, the two kingdoms would separate, and that northern city of Dan will become the site of one of the northern kingdom's uh, two temples the ones with the golden calves, which we'll talk about when we get there. Um, okay, so, uh, no, actually, I think we already talked about it. We, we talked about it when we, ta when we talked about the sin of the golden calf in the desert. Um, okay, so, the story of Samson. And here, let me give you a nice image of Samson. <clears throat> um, so, the story... Of the, the story of Samson, like Samson himself, is bigger than life. It, it reads like a fantasy. It reads like the story of Hercules or Superman. Um, now, when we moved, and, and, and it's regarded in this way as a kind of a fantasy by many, um, many observers, many commentators. Now, when, when we moved from from the Torah to Joshua, I told you at the time that we're moving from uh, we're moving from the Torah to books that are clearly clearly written as histories. 
okay, as historical texts, the book of Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. Um, <clears throat> and I told you that historians and archaeologists have devoted their careers to identifying where the text in these historical books, where the text lines up with the archaeology, and where the two don't match. Uh, and as in all ancient history, the sources are thin and incomplete, which leaves many gaps in what we can claim to verifiably know. Uh, still, in some cases, the archaeology clearly matches the text. Um, and in others, it clearly does not. And then in others still, we're left with many speculations in all directions because we simply can't know, or at least don't know yet. Um, still uncovering new artifacts all the time. Um, now, submitting, submitting the biblical text to the test of archaeology and history raises the possibility that the biblical text is not a reliable historical account of ancient Israel. Indeed, many, many, although not all, archaeologists conclude that the book of Judges contains, uh, contains Israelite fables rather than Israelite histories. Okay? Um, you know, that, that these are stories that later Jewish uh, communities told themselves about their ancient past and that these were um, th these were fairy tales. Okay, Th these were ethnic cultural uh, myths that explained various things to the Israelites about themselves hundreds of years later. But these are not historical, uh, historically reliable texts. Um, Okay, so, so many archaeologists uh, view these stories this way, but again, not all. Uh, we need to remember, though, in this, in this context, that it wasn't, it wasn't long ago that many archaeologists, many, many archaeologists, had concluded that King David was not a historical character. Okay, because they couldn't find any archaeological evidence to suggest that there was such a person as King David and a Davidian kingdom. Um, okay, so for, for a long time, it was a big debate. Did he exist? Did he not exist? And then only recently, I mean, last 20 years, I think, uh, new archaeological findings uh, proved, uh, proved them wrong, proved these archaeologists wrong, that there was such a person, there was such a king of the Israelites, and he had a a kingdom, you know, debating on the, this debate about what its borders were, but he clearly did exist. Um, I bring this up not because I want to discuss or dispel uh, the historicity of, of the book of Judges, because as we established in our discussions, we don't concern ourselves with biblical history and biblical archaeology, but with biblical literature. That said, uh, many people consider the historical authenticity of the Bible as central to the value of this book and, and central to their, to, to their religious belief in what this book conveys. Okay? That, that for many people, the, the value of this book and, and their religious faith hinge on the historical truthfulness or, or veracity of this, uh, of this book. So I want to say a word about this. I, um, <coughs> I once attended a, a talk at my university by this Israeli philosopher about some biblical topic. Um, and then in the Q&A after, after the talk, an audience member asked whether the speaker, who was a religious man himself, you know, he, was a, he wore a, a kippah. Um, so this audience member asked the, the speaker whether he, the speaker, believed that the Bible was true or truthful. To which the guy responded that it depends on what true means. 
Okay? And he gave this example, which I thought was, um, was a, a valuable one, uh, or insightful one. So he said, if, for example, I complained to John Grisham that I tried, uh, that I tried finding uh, a restaurant, a law firm, mentioned in his novel, only to find that it doesn't exist, he'd respond that his novel is not a reference book for things in the real world, uh, that its purpose is entertainment. Okay. By the same token, if I complained to the phone book company that their book is really boring, um, you know, that I, I read it and I can't get through it because it's so boring, they'd point out to me that a phone book is not a book designed to entertain a reader, it's a database. And the speaker's point was that the Bible should uh, the Bible should not be judged. At, oh, here, let me. There we go. Uh, his point was that the Bible should not be judged as um, as a book that, well, that that the Bible should be judged according to what it is, not what it's not, basically. Okay, so and, and to him, the Bible is not a history textbook, you know, or a geology textbook, or a biology textbook. Okay? The Bible, again, to him, the Bible is a book about um, Jews. It's a book for Jews about their relationship with God. Okay? It explains to them who and what they are, and who and what God is. In particular, it explains to them the fact that he is their God, that he is a just God, uh, and that he's the God of the universe who created this world that is governed by divine justice. Okay. Uh, and I think that most people who hold the Bible to be true live their religious lives according to this logic. Okay. They probably don't articulate it to themselves or to others as clearly as a philosopher would, uh, and probably aren't even aware of the contours of their thinking, but their daily lives indicate that this is their approach. Okay? The reason they don't bother solving the contradiction between the fantastical biblical stories they believe and their sober and responsible approach to daily life is that they probably believe in this book differently than they believe in, in astronomy or biology book. Okay? They don't take morality lessons from a biology or astronomy book, and they don't take astronomy lessons from the Bible. Uh, okay, so I, um, I look forward to discussing Samson with you next time, and I'll see you then.